All right. So, about me. I have a master's degree in psychology, um, as well as a second master's degree in clinical mental health counseling, specializing in crisis and trauma management, and I am currently working on my PhD in clinical psychology. Um, as far as employment goes, uh, I currently work as a foster care therapist, um, working with children that are the victims of abuse and neglect. Uh, prior to that, I actually worked in Child Protective Services as an abuse and neglect investigator. Um, I've also provided services as uh, in home, in the home, as a behavioral support for families. Um, before DCB, or sorry, before protective services would actually get called out to the home and the child would be removed. Um, I am a licensed clinician. I'm a licensed professional counselor associate, which basically means I have an early career, uh, and I am a state certified domestic violence batter intervention provider. So I do work with uh, the the. Um, the batterers in the, that have been uh, perpetrating domestic violence, which is a little bit different because usually a lot of folks think they're working with the victims. I'm working with the actual batterers themselves. So, overview. Um, pretty much it comes down to that we are using commercially available role-playing games in a therapeutic foster care setting. So these are games like D&D. Uh, personally, I prefer White Wolf's um, World of Darkness setting. Um, specifically, I found that their um, Mage the Ascension was actually the best game for what I was wanting to, to do with the kids because of the theme and the mood for the games. Um, having done a little bit of research, this is a cognitive behavioral play-based intervention, which for the folks out there that are psychologists basically means we're thinking about our behaviors and we're playing and having fun while we're doing it. Uh, the theoretical application for, so the, the entire theory behind this approach is based on learning styles, as well as cognitive behavioral interventions. Um, this is a basic clinical project. Um, it is not a proper scientific study. It was just me kind of derping around in my office one day, say, looking at my Demon the Fallen book going, wow, how can I bring this and show the kids the awesome that I have? Talked to my, my uh, directors. They said, write up a PowerPoint. I did. I did research to support my idea. And then they said, go. Um, so the demographic inter inter uh, information for this project, uh, again, there's a therapeutic foster care agency. Uh, we used a third edition mage, uh, tabletop rules, but we did incorporate some uh, LARP and some Chronicles of Darkness rules adjustments. So for those of you that are familiar with mage, we combined Awakening and Ascension in the parts that were really neat. Um, this initially started in 2012, and we had 16 individuals that participated in the project. We had three males, uh, three white males that were over the age of 30, five female, white females over the, that were also over the age of 30, one African American female that was over the age of 30, two males, two white males, um, age 11 to 16, two males uh, age 19, two white females, 18 to 20, and one male that was age 28. Um, so the premise behind this is that as a clinical intervention, role-playing games can facilitate social skill development through vicarious experiences, and that the outcomes can be generalized to uh, include the experiences that they have through commercially available role-playing games. So what does that mean? In short form, it means if your kid's acting like a monster in the home, you go out, you buy them a book of D&D, you sit down, you play with them, and over time, if you have an idea as to what you're doing, you may be able to see some behavioral changes as a result. So no like super expensive therapy sessions that may or may not be covered by your insurance. You're teaching them basic social skills through play. Um, so key points with this, role play as a clinical intervention is one of the staples of the cognitive behavioral uh, school of thought. And so it's empirically tested. We know that it works. Uh, direct and vicarious experiences, these provide the individuals with opportunities to use different social skills. And that social skill improvement occurs through repeated successful applications that result in positively perceived outcomes. This is really important because if you, 
What I have found, especially in the kid, in working with children that have been abused and neglected, is that they are lacking opportunities to engage in the skills. It's not that they don't know them. It's not that they are incapable of performing them. It's that the opportunities that would normally be available to uh, children within their age range have not been available to them. And so at this point, the game, the, the role-playing game as in, its, in and of itself seeks to fill in that gap. And it's through the repeated successful applications. When they succeed in the game, good things happen. When they fail in the game, bad things happen, and they've got to come right back around and try again. And then as the primary storyteller, dungeon master, called the guy that's helping craft the story, it's my job to go and to help uh, motivate the kids to, th to, to think outside the box, to not get fixated on this one simple way of thinking and way of approaching a problem. So in this way, they're helping develop um, cognitive flexibility, problem solving skills. So role playing games. We know that they're an accepted method of engaging in vicarious learning experiences. We create characters. We live, uh, we, we, we experience these characters uh, in just a short little snapshot of their lives. And in doing so, we get a better understanding not only of the, the characters' experiences, but also as uh, we perceive those experiences. Um, and then these experiences also provide opportunities to develop new behavioral responses that can be generalized to a variety of experiences. So, Let's say, we'll just take a, a basic concept from Vampire the Masquerade. When you, when you first bring in a new character, what do you want to do? Well, if you're a vampire, you have to get acknowledged by the prince. How do you do that? Well, walking up to the prince and throwing a pie in the face, not exactly the best way to get that acknowledgement. But engaging in socially appropriate methods of interaction Saying hi, introducing yourself, letting them know why you're hanging out in their city. These are all things that will allow for successful resolution, and they will get you that acknowledgement. Well, when you're you know, generalizing that outward, so that's just in the, in the character microcosm, expand it outward, and when you go into a new setting, let's say that you're going into a yeah, business meeting. Let's say you're, you're, you're an adult, you're going into a business meeting. What do you do? You walk up to folks, you say hi, you, you talk to them, you engage them in conversation about the topic. The behaviors in one can generalize into the other because what allows it to happen is the fact that the, what they've got in common is the good social skills. And they're both opportunities to practice those skills. Um, now, these outcomes are reflected in social learning theory, which uh, Bandura put forward was the behavioral expressions are reinforced or extinguished based on observed or experienced consequences. So, if you are in the in game world, if you're playing a character or a series of characters who constantly make dumb mistakes, and the way the player's self correct is your character's end up bye-bye. Well, then eventually, it takes some time, but eventually you learn to not do <laughs> the behaviors that are what were what was eventually giving your characters to a bye-bye. So those those that tendency towards inappropriate behavior gets extinguished. Same things here. Yelling at your mom because you don't like her shoes is not going to help her uh, help motivate her to pick you up after school and take you to basketball practice. So what we've what it comes down to is that role play, whether it's tabletop or LARP, uh, ultimately is as a strategy as far as for behavior formation, it's a direct application of social learning theory. So with this, as far as the opportunities to use different social skills what's kind of going on underneath the surface. So in, a, in any role-playing game, you've got an individual that's taken on the role of another. 
they're shifting their perspective towards that of their character. Um, an example might be, I have, uh, in one character that I played at one point, was a, um, was a Nazi. Straight from World War II, you know, Hitler's youth, straight up the way through that. In order to appropriately roleplay that, I had to be able to do the history and then understand what it meant to be, to live in that time, to be surrounded by those societal messages. And, and then answer the question, how would an individual like that perceive the world today? And so in that, in that way, we are shifting perspective. So with this, they're either going to imitate the demonstrated behavioral expression, or they'll choose a different behavioral expression if it's unfavorable. Getting back to my vampire ex example, if you are, if you throw the pie in their face and you have to create a, a new character for the next game, then that was obviously an unfavorable experience. So you're not going to be likely to do that again. However, it may take a couple of pies before you realize that. That's the one thing that's really important to understand. These are not going to be like immediate changes in behavior. There's got to be an accumulation of experience. I think of it kind of like Legos. Like if you ever try to build a Lego wall, each block is a different set of experiences. And whether it's positive or negative, it tends to be or favorable or unfavorable outcomes. It's really nothing more than the color of the block that you're using. All right. So then the increased repetition of experiences and outcomes, it's going to increase the salience of the experience. So how relevant is it to the individual? And which is going to make it easier to recall. Um, and so resulting in cognitive priming. Cognitive priming is actually what helps to generalize behaviors from one situational context to another. And it then feeds back into, and once they start to generalize it, which way do I go? Do I go left or do I go right? And in the end, all of this, these applications are additional opportunities to practice some of the most basic social skills that are out there. Saying please, saying thank you, advocating yourself, advocating your needs and your wants. And these additional opportunities and when you have the opportunity to be able to do them, will, in time, result in skill mastery. And that's ultimately what it's about. That's where the individuals who haven't had the opportunities can now get them. Um, facilitates school, uh, skill development through vicarious experiences and that outcomes can be generalized to include uh, commercially available tabletop games in, that are used in non-clinical settings. Um, role playing incorporates direct and vicarious learning experiences in a variety of different domains, allowing participants to explore different behavioral responses and analyzing overall effectiveness on personal gain. That's motivation right there. Why should I bother doing this if I'm not going to get anything from it? Why should I not throw a pie in the prince's face? Well, because you're going to have to create a new character. That's why. And do you want to spend the, the three hours that you spent writing up that character, do you want to spend another three hours creating another one? Sometimes it just helps to just be polite. <laughs> um, now, limitations. This is not a properly developed scientific study. Um, there's no IRB approval. Uh, there is no clear recognition of variables, no clear methodology, insufficient sample size, insufficient population access to established statistical power, aka this is the worst scientific experiment ever. Um, it is utilizing commercially available role-playing games. Uh, regardless of implement, uh, excuse me, implementation method uh, can provide mental health behavioral therapists with low-cost alternatives to improving social skills. However, that only works if the Therapists know what they're doing. If they've played these games, then they can see the connection. 
So as you were talking about earlier, the, uh, the learning curve can be, and then how Hawk was talking about earlier, the learning curve can be kind of steep because how can you run a game if you don't know the rules yourself? All right, so future research opportuni uh, opportunities. Does the content of the session influence the extent to which social skill development occurs? So if I'm running a game that is a standard court game for a vampire, Does that, uh, does those type of games actually influence the intensity of the social skill development? And would the results be generalizable to include live action role playing games? So tabletop is one thing, LARP is something entirely different. Um, are they generalizable? And then how does the social skill development of the population that engages in role-playing activities compare against those within the same population that doesn't engage in role-playing activities. AKA, am I more likely to become polite because I play role-playing games as compared to my peers who do not? And finding a way to measure the rate at which that uh, development occurs. And, and, that's a bit of and there you go, contact info.